Hello everyone, uh, my name is Creighton Kellum and today I'm going to be talking with you about my research on using fluorine NMR as a tool to screen for potential inhibitors against an antibiotic resistant enzyme called R67 dihydrofolate reductase. Uh, so this here is actually a painting of different uh, representations of R67 and it was done by my PI Dr. Elizabeth Howell unfortunately she passed away last year um, but she spent a good portion of her career uh, studying this enzyme uh, so first a little bit of background on the folate pathway uh, so folate or vitamin B9 metabolism uh, is crucial for many biological processes but the one that we care most about uh, for drug design is uh, nucleic acid synthesis uh, which basically means making DNA. So because of this uh, many drugs uh, both chemotherapy drugs such as 5-FU and methotrexate and antibiotics such as trimethoprim and uh, sulfonamides uh, they target this pathway. The idea being uh, that by inhibiting DNA synthesis you can prevent the proliferation of harmful cells. So a key enzyme in this pathway is dihydrofolate reductase. Um, it catalyzes the reduction of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. The e, -chromo e. coli chromosomal variant of this enzyme is inhibited by an antibiotic called trimethoprim. The problem is, is trimethoprim resistance has become very widespread uh, and this is due to the introduction of a plasmid encoded uh, R67 dihydrofolate reductase which is structurally and catalytically distinct uh, from the chromosomal dihydrofolate reductase. Uh, so here are the structures of the two enzymes as you can see they look uh, nothing alike um, and then here is the uh, trimethoprim, the antibiotic that targets this enzyme, uh, the E. coli chromosomal DHFR. So there currently are no FDA approved inhibitors of R67. So the NMR screening uh, method that I'll be discussing today uh, could potentially be used by pharmaceutical companies if they so desire uh, to help design and or discover new inhibitors of R67. Okay, so a little bit about uh, fluorine NMR uh, as a tool for studying drug binding. Um, so there are, there are many different types of NMR. Fluorine NMR is mostly used in biochemistry to study protein dynamics, ligand binding, and then drug discovery, uh, which is the application we will be using it for. Uh, so basically how this works is uh, the NMR provides us with a spectra that produce, uh, produces peaks at certain chemical shifts, and these peaks can be analyzed to gain information about the molecule being examined. So for fluorine NMR, uh, we incorporate fluorine into the molecule that we want to examine, in our case the protein, R67, uh, and then changes in the chemical shift occur due to a changing chemical environment such as a drug or ligand binding. Uh, so to, to use NMR for this purpose we had to incorporate uh, fluorine into our protein. Uh, so we did this by adding fluorine to the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, and we did this with four different variants, so 4F, 5F, 6F, and 7F. So this is just adding fluorine at different positions on the indole ring of tryptophan. Um, so how we did this is we incorporated these fluoroindole rings into uh, the cells growing in uh, media uh, for protein expression. So after incorporating uh, this fluoroindole rings in, we induce expression of the protein with IPTG in the, the LAC operon system, um, and the protein incorporated these indole rings into the tryptophan amino acids uh, in our protein. So there are eight tryptophans in R67. Um, however, since it's a homo tetramer, there's two per monomer, and we only see two NMR peaks. Um, and so the ones that we see here are tryptophan 38s here and here at the dimer-dimer interface and then tryptophan 45s uh, out here at the monomer-monomer interface. And a quick note on how we assign these peaks. Uh, so as you can tell here, here's the NMR spectra for 4F and for 5F, um, tryptophan 38 and tryptophan 45 respectively. Uh, so we determine this by constructing a mutant protein so 4F uh, uh, tryptophan 45 to phenylalanine and by uh, substituting in phenylalanine for tryptophan we see this tryptophan 45 peak disappear so we know that that peak is tryptophan 45 and that was tryptophan 38. 
Um, but before I get into the NMR experiments with the drugs that we've been studying, I need to talk a little bit about uh, these EC50 assays. So uh, EC50 assays or IC50, the terms can be used interchangeably in this case. Um, these were done uh, in order to identify inhibitors um, of R67. And these were done with molecules that we knew would bind or we suspected would bind. Um, so these assays were done using a UV-Vis spectrometer and basically the idea is we measure enzyme activity as a function of increasing drug concentration. And as you can see, naproxen, finformin, hippuric acid, and acetyl salicylic acid, um, which is aspirin, uh, they all inhibit this enzyme with naproxen being the best inhibitor. Um, so this EC50 value is the drug concentration at which the enzyme activity is inhibited by half or the drug is effective uh, by 50%. And then Ki is the inhibition constant. So this is similar to a dis dissociation constant or a michaelis minton constant. Um, basically, the lower the number, the higher affinity that the inhibitor has for this enzyme. Um, so the main reason that we uh, did these assays was to know that we had inhibitors. Um, so that, now that we know that these drugs bind uh, and inhibit R67, we're hoping that uh, our NMR assays would show up, show their binding as well. Okay, so a little bit about the NMR assays. Um, so first of all, just basically uh, how this uh, works, uh, I'll describe it a little bit with this this uh, figure here. Um, so this is uh, for the 4F R67 dihydrofolate, uh, and this bottom. Um, NMR spectra is the APO R67 enzyme. So this means the enzyme without anything bound to it. This next spectra is um, the spectra with the addition of NADP+. And as you can tell here, this tryptophan 38 peak broadens considerably, and this signifies NADP plus binding. And then when the substrate dihydrofolate is uh, added as well, we see a very distinct uh, tryptophan 38 peak split into uh, three different smaller peaks. So the idea is hopefully uh, we would see inhibitor binding by a distinct tryptophan 38 peak uh, here. Okay, um, and then this image here is an image of the binding site. Uh, so this blue is dihydrofolate um, and the tryptophan 38 residues are here and here. And then tryptophan 45s are, are going to be out here and uh, as you can tell on this spectra their peaks do not change uh, upon ligand binding. Okay, uh, so now the NMR with the drugs. Um, so unfortunately for um, three of the drugs, uh, so all of them except naproxen, we did not see distinct binding uh, upon addition of the drugs. Uh, naproxen, um, we believe that we will. We actually need to do some more experiments with this. Uh, as you can tell here, there is some difference uh, in the shapes of the peaks upon naproxen binding. Uh, this is using 5F though, and this really isn't ideal. We need to repeat it with 4F, um, but this whole coronavirus situation has sort of prevented us uh, from doing that. Um, however, we believe that naproxen uh, will show up and be detectable by this NMR method. Okay, so why uh, why can we not see these other drugs? So it's actually kind of interesting, and, and it can be viewed as a positive um, in that it's providing us site-specific information about inhibitor binding. Um, so if you look at the structure of acetyl salicylic acid here and hippuric acid here, um, these mimic this pobaglutamate tail of dihydrofolate. Uh, finformin, which is not shown, also mimics uh, this motif of dihydrofolate. Um, so these inhibitors are probably binding out here where the pobaglutamate tail of dihydrofolate binds. Uh, and, and this, as you can tell, it's going to be further away from the tryptophan 38 that has the fluorine on it. So that's probably why we're not seeing it on NMR. In contrast, naproxen has this fused ring structure uh, that is somewhat similar to this uh, terran ring of dihydrofolate. Um, so we believe that naproxen might be binding somewhat closer uh, to this Terran subsite, is what we're calling it, which is where the reaction center uh, is actually happening. Um, so the big takeaway here is 
um, that this NMR method will pick up inhibitors um, in drug screening approaches. However, it will only pick up inhibitors that bind to this Terran subsite. Um, now, in some ways, this could be viewed as a positive. Um, and, and the reason for that is we suspect that inhibitors that bind to this Terran subsite will be better inhibitors. And that's because of the uh, interactions actually in the active site that secure this Terran ring. So these isoleucine uh, 68 hydrogen bonding interactions have been uh, found to be very important um, for uh, for substrate binding. Um, and in contrast, this pyroglutamate tail actually uh, flops around in this active site. So okay, so a couple general conclusions. Um, so this uh, fluorine NMR method um, with R67 uh, can be used to screen for inhibitors uh, of this enzyme. Uh, however, it's, it is important to note that as it currently is, it will only uh, identify inhibitors that bind to the Terran subsite. Again, I've laid out some reasons that this might actually be a positive, but if one wanted uh, information about inhibitor binding to the pyroglutamate subsite, a, a potential solution would be to construct a mutant enzyme with fluoro incorporation out closer to this pyroglutamate subsite. Um, another uh, sort of uh, Cool takeaway here is uh, fluorine NMR can be used in cell or in cell lysates. Uh, so this allows for, to an, for the analysis of the effects of inhibitors in a cell's natural crowded environment, um, which is very different from just inside a test tube with uh, like a buffer solution. Um, and so this, this could be uh, advantageous for, for drug research as well. Um, and then a final note here is uh, previous research that we've done in our lab suggests that 4F and 5F um, variants uh, should be used and the reason for this is that they offer minimal structural and catalytic uh, impact on the enzyme. Uh, 7F for instance uh, might cause some some structural and catalytic problems um, so it's probably not ideal uh, to be used for this method.